Hello, Palo Alto. Today is Friday, December 4th, 2020, and In Focus starts right now. Welcome to In Focus. I'm Stella Essemacher. We hope you're having a great week. While the hybrid learning plan approved by the PAUSE Board of Education was put on hold with the move to the purple tier in Santa Clara County, many students, parents, and staff voiced their concerns at last month's meeting. In Focus reporter Nikki Behal talked to students about their views on this decision and hybrid learning in general. Palo Alto schools have been shut down since March. Students have been adapting to new circumstances with distance learning. As time continues to pass, students have been given the option to return to campus as soon as January to take part in a hybrid learning model. Some students are leaning towards continuing with the distance learning model. I'm leaning towards the distance learning because I feel like for my type of like learning situation, I learn better um, when I when I can like pace myself at like the only like, rate I can go and um I feel like online's more um, like you're able to kind of pace yourself and do things like when you want or like when fixed when it fits in your schedule. I'm leaning towards distance learning just because not take like not even taking into account that like we're in the purple um, for Santa Clara County, just like it's not worth it for me only going back for history and English classes because those um, aren't my more difficult classes and I just don't think it's worth the risk of like exposing myself given that I'm only gonna have those two classes. Many have been eager to return to campus but recent developments have made them change their minds. I think that the school board did a very lackluster job in um, uh, getting a good reopening plan. I, uh, I watched the school board meeting and I was not impressed. For the last three months or so I've been extremely into getting back to school, but the more I look at the hybrid plan, the more I start to really dislike it, especially the stuff where you can't join too many extracurriculars, you have to quarantine if a student gets exposed. I'm just learning more and more stuff about it and it's getting to seem like a worse option. Part of the aspect of wanting to go back is like the social interaction that you'd have with people. But if you're just in a cohort of like 30 people, you're just gonna like be with the same people every single day. So like, like, the, like the whole idea of their schedule is to try and limit intermingling between the kids. But that's one of the aspects that's nice about actually being in person. Pali students and staff had had to overcome new obstacles in online learning and will continue to persevere next semester, no matter what learning model they choose. For in focus, I'm Nikki Bahal. Thanks for that, Nikki. While hybrid learning is controversial in the Palo Alto community, the debate around daylight savings happens among people from all around the world. Anish Chawari talks with a researcher at UC Berkeley on why we change time zones twice a year. On November 1st, clocks were moved back an hour, marking the end of daylight savings time. This one hour time change has detrimental effects to our physical and mental health. Etty Ben Simon, a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley, describes these effects. Two types of effects we can talk about. One is losing an hour of sleep, which what happens when we enact daylight saving time, so in the spring, uh, because the clock is sprung forward, we actually lose an hour of sleep. And when we lose that hour of sleep, we see a lot of effects on human behavior. People tend to um, suffer more cardiovascular, so heart attacks. When we switch to daylight saving time, uh, people tend to get involved more in car accidents and work accidents. We have a lot of evidence that people, uh, when they lose an hour of sleep or when they just lose sleep in general, they tend to be less social. Uh, they're less interested in interacting with other people and they feel lonelier as well. And we see that uh, when we, if we focus, let's say, on children and uh, teenagers, we see that they are less motivated to learn and they also uh, feel uh, worse about, uh, about themselves. In 2018, California voters voted in favor of Proposition 7, which would establish year-long daylight savings time in the state. However, 
this measure hasn't been enacted yet. Kansen Chu, a Bay Area Assembly member who authored the proposition, explains why. The proposition, uh, part of the Proposition 7 is to allow the legislature to decide uh, which way we want it to go. So um, I left it that way because uh, if, if for whatever reason the future legislature want to change this practice, they, want, they don't have to go back to the voter. They, they we can just change it by the vote of the legislature. So after Proposition 7 passed, uh, I introduced a bill of AB7, trying to put uh, California into year-long daylight saving time. But in order to implement that, we need the uh, uh, federal government, the Congress have to change a uniform time map uh, to allow the state the option of going to uh, daylight saving time year round. For this bill to be approved, it will need to be advocated for at the state and federal level. You need to uh, uh, write to your congressman and encourage people to also uh, uh, write to their congressman to to put it in 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 in, in their agenda that we need to put some pressure, write, email, text, fax to the uh, 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 legislature to, uh, to pass that bill. Then finally, the bill will go to the desk of the governor. So we also need to uh, put some pressure uh, uh, to, uh, on the governor to sign it into the law. Even though a time change will still be occurring for the time being, Simon shares what people can do to prepare for the switch. So what we can do is to try and a few days before or the change to go to sleep one hour earlier. So we slowly allow ourselves to get that extra hour of sleep when the change is going to come. To learn more, visit the University of California's article, Daylight Savings Time Saves No One. For In Focus, I'm Anish Tiwari. Thanks for that, Anish. In most years, Santa Clara County polling stations are staffed 80% by workers 65 and older. With the coronavirus pandemic, these populations were at greater risk and were more limited in their ability to work the polls. This year, a greater number of high school students were able to volunteer or work the polls. Lulu Gaither has more. Every four years, the presidential election is often one of the most stressful and busy times for the United States, especially now due to COVID-19. With more spare time and interest in politics, High schoolers begin to work at the polling stations in order to get a closer look at what happens behind the scenes of the elections. With the rise of COVID-19, the voting booths look quite different than they regularly do. Laura Malagrino and Adora Zhang are two students who got a first-hand experience of working in the voting booths. I worked at Rinconada Library. Um, I worked two days. On Sunday, I worked from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then on election day, I worked from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. I worked at the Mitchell Park Vote Center and I only worked one day. So I didn't work election day. I worked November 2nd. So it was the Monday before the election. Adora explains the benefits of working for the polls other than for the experience. I did get paid. I think, yeah, you could choose to either work for community service hours or for a stipend. So I went for the stipend. I think it was like $100 for that one day. While expecting more of a crowd, Laura had a fairly quiet day. And due to the COVID working conditions for most people, the voters coming in came at all times throughout the day. I think because people like work over Zoom, they can kind of just like leave when they don't have a meeting and then go back and like just join into a meeting so it was pretty spread out throughout the day and we never really had a line. Dozens of high school students signed up to work at the polls yet Adora worked with few at her location. There weren't actually that many other high school students. I'm pretty sure I was the only one at Mitchell Park that day. Mostly it was like older more experienced election workers that were around me. Both workers had different roles in their poll but were both equally impactful to the process of the polls. Obs- you could have as a as a like volunteer was to basically just clean everything so we had bins with face shields and face masks and gloves and hand sanitizer um and like cloths 
So you either like handed people hand sanitizer when they walked in and if they didn't have a mask, you would hand them a mask and ask them if they wanted like gloves or a face shield or anything like that. Um, and you'd always give them hand sanitizer when they entered and when they left. I was a greeter. So basically like as voters came in, I kind of asked them some questions about the registration and whether they needed to like make any updates to their address or anything, and then directed them to the right line based on that. Through their experience working at the polls, Adora and Laura recall some of their most memorable moments. My favorite part was definitely just seeing voters so excited. I'm pretty sure there were like 10 people who came in and said it was their first time voting ever. And I don't know, generally it was pretty cool to see kind of the process up close. Everyone was really nice and super welcoming and like you could feel that we were like all excited to be working. Although they only worked for one or two days, this job taught them a lot about how a polling station functions and all of the work that goes into it. For me, it was just from from the beginning, from training all the way until the day working, just seeing like all the manpower that goes behind elections and how like people driven it is was really cool to me because I think before, I mean, I was way younger, um, but it always felt like elections were very isolated and like some higher power was just doing everything. But really it's every single poll worker amounts to the process working out. I've never been to a polling station, so it was nice to kind of see how it functions. And I feel like now when I am able to vote, I'll be like really knowledgeable. and I'll know exactly how to do it. While the elections and polling stations look a bit different than usual, those involved learn much about the election process and the importance of each individual person involved, whether they are coming to vote or working. Thank you so much for watching. For In Focus, I'm Lulu Gaither. Back to you. That does it for today's show. Be sure to check out our website, subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch previous content, follow us on Instagram to engage with our content, and Twitter for updates and breaking news. Until next time, I'm Stella Essenmacher, and this has been In Focus.